Thank you, Rick, and it's a privilege to be here. I really appreciate the invitation by uh, Mort, yourself, and the committee. Uh, just from this slide, you can see that I really am a country doctor, Mort. I'm from Minnesota. Minnesota is somewhere east of the Hudson River. Not only that, it's even west of the Mississippi. It doesn't quite get beyond the Missouri, but it's right at the border. And lastly, I'm second generation. My dad was a GP in a town of 600 people in Wisconsin. So when I say I'm a country doc, I'm not some guy from Manhattan. <laughs> These are uh, different funding mechanisms I've had, and there are no uh, conflicts. For this talk, it would be very clinical, and there'd be four questions. What are the clinical manifestations of autoimmunity and CLL? What are the associations? What's the biology? And what are the treatment approaches? And to start out, these are the pictures of autoimmunity and CLL. There's pink plasma at the top, for hemolysis. This is what happens to red cells when they break down and how they're broken down and what the clinical manifestations are. This is the Coombs test, or the direct antiglobulin test, as will be referred to at DAT in this presentation. Perineoplastic pimpagus, a terrible disease, very, very uncomfortable. You can see the lips, you can see the mouth, some of the most uncomfortable patients you ever want to see. Now, it's, it, it probably even is bad or worse than graft versus host disease. This is dark urine. Patient had cold agglutinin disease and underlying CLL. So in one slide, we'll take a few minutes, and this really outlines the whole uh, pathophysiology of what we're talking about today. This is the CLL cell. There can be issues of antigen, antigenic presentation, cytokine secretion and cell-cell contact, antigenic drive, and autoantibody secretion. So in the first mechanism, the red cell may act as an antigen-presenting cell. So when it does so, uh, there's the T cell reactivity that then the B cells interact, produce polyclonal immunoglobulins, you get autoimmune hemolytic anemia, or ITP. In the second mechanism, there can be inhibitory cytokines. So we've heard about some of these things uh, this morning in the elegant presentations of Dr. K, Furman, O'Brien, and Brown in many different ways, and you see a few of these things coming back to haunt us. And these things can then uh, facilitate the escape of self-reactive cells. The third and perhaps even more devastating manifestations are when we get cross-reactive monoclonal antibodies from the CLL cell. So the first example is that of perineoplastic pimpagus where these, uh, these antibodies then act at the dermal epidermal ju junction or you can get anti-IgM antibodies which then result in cold agglutinin disease. And then lastly, there's that of the antigenic drive, or we've heard an awful lot about the B-cell receptor today, and I won't go through uh, many of the details of this. For those of you that want to read an elegant paper, this paper was just came out in blood this year, and uh, we've talked this morning about CXCR4, we've talked about some of the implications of NF-kappa B. All of these things are probably can play some roles in some of these manifestations. And we've also talked about the B-cell receptor and its activation and then what some of the consequences are. And it's likely we'll find out more about these, these uh, manifestations of autoimmunity through these mechanisms over time. There are acquired T-cell defects. There are numerical increases in T-cells. There's an inversion of the CD4, CD8 level that can occur. We've talked about the inhibitory cytokines. There are alterations in T-cell cytokines skeleton formation and vesicle transformation. Uh, some of the vesicle uh, issues were talked about by Dr. K uh, this morning. 
far as the markers that we would all understand in the disease from a clinical perspective, there are associations with an unmutated IGVH gene. High ZAP70 expression has been associated along with an increased serum beta-2 microglobulin. And we know that CLL is associated with an impaired innate immune system. And in fact, when you really look at this disease and you look at acquired immune deficiency syndrome, they have some rather remarkable uh, overlap in their presentations uh, and clinical complications and implications of management. So why else is this important? Is it important how the patient might be managed? Well, first of all, a rise stage three or four, a benet stage C patient could be downstaged to a one or a two RI or an A benet. Patients with active autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP are unfortunately excluded from randomized clinical trials. And interestingly, autoimmune disease cytopenia occurred in all stages of CLL and patients responded well to treatment and AID did not alter overall survival. And AID contributed to death in only six patients in a paper by Clive Zent and colleagues uh, out of uh, Mayo in Rochester. I think this was really an important paper when this came out in an observation and that it really took a reasonable number of patients and looked at bone marrow failure versus AID. And you could appreciate that in patients with bone marrow failure, the median overall survival was 4.4 years versus 9.1 years in that and it's rather remarkably different and before some of the newer treatments that we have now. And this was the original uh, survival curve out of that data. So what's the uh, incidence of a positive Coombs test? Uh, 2.3 to 7 percent in different papers. It's associated with advanced stage, active CLL, and older patients independent of stage or duration. What about the prognosis? In at least uh, two papers that are very large series, uh, the data set by Clive Zent, and others, immune cytopenia, patients had a superior overall survival. And in a data from Marino and colleagues, 961 patients, immune cytopenias had a superior overall survival. The, in, Morrow, in the Morrow paper, there was no uh, difference. In the Dearden, a positive DAT had a poor response to treatment. In the CCL4 trial, Interestingly, the result the, in patients followed that then have a positive DAT after treatment. Interestingly, after the fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, the Coombs test was 10 percent uh, of patients and autoimmune hemolytic anemia occurring in 5 percent, which was statistically significantly different from the other arms. In the German CLL8 trial and the FC plus or minus R, the autoimmune hemolytic anemia risk was 1 percent. And the conclusion of uh, this data from different uh, individuals is that the risk after purine analogs appears to be no greater. How might these patients be treated? There are at least three references talking about some of this. And in the Mayo series, 34 of 37 patients received treatment that was specifically directed at the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. 86% received corticosteroids, a CR in 35%, and 14, uh, I'm sorry, 38% had a PR, and the median duration of that response was 0.62 years. Well, what about ITP? Again, I think our problem with ITP is, is that to get the diagnosis, it's very much a clinical diagnosis, and we can't do a single laboratory test to establish the diagnosis. The incidence is less than 1 percent to 5 percent in some different series. Interestingly, a positive Coombs test in 47 percent in patients with ITP was reported in the series from Mayo, and others have uh, reported similar numbers. In our experience, 89% uh, of them were treated. The majority received corticosteroids, and there were 29% that went into complete remission and 35% in partial remission for a median duration of response of 1.9 years. So there are no trials that are prospective or that can tell us uh, exactly what to do in a randomized way. 
The consensus appears to be that if the CLL is quiescent, then to treat the IT as ITP only, so corticosteroids and splenectomy, alternative immunosuppression, rituximab, IV immunoglobulin, thrombopoietin receptor agonist, and then if active disease, treat the underlying disease. I did talk with uh, Susan O'Brien, and there is no data on abrutinib for those of you that might have that question. Purine analogs should be avoided in patients with a history of autoimmune uh, cytopenias, particularly if they were related. In uh, an experience reported by Deb Bowen uh, from our group, uh, 20 patients were treated with RCVP, and four, 14 of the 20 went into complete remission. It's interesting that there was a paper that looked at 1,278 patients that demonstrated acute ITP at diagnosis or at any time in the disease was associated with an inferior outcome compared to those who never had ITP. However, in a follow-up uh, paper, this is probably related to the association of ITP with unmutated Ig. V, IGVH gene. Pure red cell aplasia can occur. Its incidence is 0.5% to 2%. The diagnosis is established by parvovirus. In the experience uh, at our institution, nine of nine, uh, seven of nine uh, were treated with corticosteroids, and in five it was the only treatment. The median duration of response was 0.24 years. Autoimmune neutropenia. Uh, has been reported. I think it's difficult to sort through that data. And now uh, also with uh, rituximab-induced uh, neutropenia, that's going to be a little more difficult to establish a diagnosis. There are no cases of acquired hemophilia or acquired von Willebrand's disease. Is, he, is AID a risk for developing CLL? There are a number of case reports and scattered things in the literature there was a Nordic case control study uh, looking in, in that uh, reported that the risk of CLL was much higher in patients with a positive personal or family history of CLL. That's as discussed in things this morning. Interestingly, in, in individuals who developed CLL, they had a much higher incidence of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, a 3.86-fold risk. Clinically apparent autoimmune disorders have been reported retrospectively in 2 to 12 percent of patients. Positive sero, uh, serum markers, serologic autoimmunity, so the rheumatoid factor and so forth, have been reported in 8 to 41 percent of patients. And if you really try to go through this literature, it's very complicated and muddy. But in case control studies do not suggest an increase in autoimmune diseases, these other things other than mentioned in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So we talked about the two, uh, first two bullets. Then there, there is, uh, I think, reasonable evidence to, to suggest peripheral neuropathy can be associated with an antimyelin-associated glycoprotein antibody, and that focal crescentic, focal crescentic pouchy immune cellular injur injury, or the ANCA, uh, is, has been reported and likely related. There are no associations with angioedema or with renal diseases, so other membrane proliferative glomerular nephritides and so forth. So in conclusion, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP are strongly associated with CLL, and the management of these require careful clinical considerations. Thank you so much.